You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Max A. Pooch's Awesome Animal Advocates on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Keith Sanderson, animal advocate, writer, and human companion to Max A. Pooch, canine crusader for animals and the environment. Max and I thank you for joining us, and we dedicate this episode as we dedicate every episode to those amazing people who work to save the lives and or improve conditions of companion, domestic, or wild animals. Our guest today is Julie Adams of Chicago Cat Rescue. Julie founded Chicago Cat Rescue in 2006 with Cindy Ruback, a fellow cat lover and animal advocate. Recently, Chicago Cat Rescue held its sixth annual Sexy Black event to help educate and create awareness about a syndrome that is peculiar to black cats and dogs. We'll meet Julie in a moment and she will tell us about Chicago Cat Rescue and what its Sexy Black event is all about. But first, this word from our sponsors. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to AudibleDeals.com. That's AudibleDeals.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Max A. Pooch's Awesome Animal Advocates. I'm your host, Keith Sanderson, and with us today is Julie Adams, co-founder of Chicago Cat Rescue. Welcome, Julie. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Keith. I really appreciate it. Well, we've been looking forward to this because even though you're Chicago Cat Rescue, your work goes beyond that. But first of all, can you tell us a little bit about Chicago Cat Rescue and what the mission of your organization is? Sure, I'd love to. Um, Chicago Cat Rescue, uh, again, founded in 2006. We are a all-foster-based rescue group and all-volunteer-run, which means I do this as a side job. <laughs> So being a foster-based rescue group, you know, every animal that we have and rescue off the streets goes straight into foster homes where they're placed until they get adopted. So it's really a great way to save animals, you know, within the city and to work with other people who are animal lovers such as ourselves. And, um, you know, we're dedicated to improving the lives of animals in Chicago and we do a lot of education and outreach part of our mission as well is to empower our community to take action and sort of join us in our mission. So that's a little bit about us. Well, that's great. Now, you said all your the cats you find homes for are kept in foster homes. Mm -hmm. Do you believe there was any benefits to adopting a cat that was in a foster home? Absolutely. You know, there's benefits for the cat as well as the adopter. What's great from the cat's perspective is, you know, they're they're in a home environment, you know, so they they get to go about their daily routine as they would in an adoptive home. And that information and that experience from an adopter's perspective is great to have because as an adopter, you're going in and you're meeting a lot of different cats. When you have a cat in an actual home environment, you get more of a true read on the cat's personality and their needs and their overall demeanor, which just ultimately makes a better match when you're matching adopters with cats. So, 
you know, you might have a shy cat. You know, some people are open to shy cats. You know, we know if we have a shy cat, we can direct them that way. If we have a really outgoing, crazy, high-energy kitten, and that's what they're looking for, we can place them, you know, we can make that match with a a high-energy cat. So it really, overall, there's a lot of benefits to having cats in foster homes just because of the, the information that we can get from them and then share on to the adopter. Well, that's interesting. I think mm-hmm. that makes sense. We have friends who adopted a cat and they love it, but one thing they didn't know about it is they thought later they were going to get another dog, but oh, yeah. now that cat won't allow a dog in the house. No. <laughs> in fact, yeah. they brought yeah. a, a rescue dog home to try him out. Oh, and the yeah. cat was so defensive that even when the dog was outside, the cat would rush to the window and try to get out to uh, chase the dog away. So, <laughs> oh, so, my goodness. <laughs> so, so they might have uh, been a little better off, although they love the cat. And it, sure, it, sure. It's oh, yeah. At home. But it's yeah. sort of maybe made it so a dog doesn't get a home. In Aww. late February, Chicago Cat Rescue held its uh, sixth annual Sexy Black. And can you tell us what the purpose of that event was? Absolutely, yes. Sexy Black. It was our sixth annual Sexy Black, so we are very excited to have been able to hold this event for six years in a row. And it was actually designed six years ago based on the fact that shelters and rescue groups such as ourselves just Across the board, we all experience what has been termed black cat and dog syndrome. It's just sort of a, you know, a casual term um, that we all use because every time we rescue a, a black cat, as well as, you know, other groups who bring in cats and black dogs, they're really, really hard to adopt. And we just, just this underlying frustration that has built over the years, you know, in Chicago Cat Rescue of why aren't these amazing black cats that we have in our program getting adopted and no one would even call to want to meet them. And we just thought, you know what, we got to start raising awareness for these black animals because they are equally as amazing as all the other various colors that you can choose from. So we created this event called Sexy Black and it's specifically to raise awareness for black cats and dogs. And the first year we held it, we had close to a hundred people there, which just really was, we did not expect that number. It was amazing. People were just so excited to be able to come to this event to raise awareness on behalf of their their black cat or dog that they had adopted because they had known of this syndrome and then a lot of people had not known of it so they came out to uh, support the black cats and dogs so it's it's really been a phenomenal event and I, I believe it's actually made just a little bit of a difference you know just within the first six years so it's going good. Well, that's great. And uh, I'm going to ask you right now to let us know in plenty of time next year because Max A. Pooch is a black rescue dog. And oh, he, he, yeah. And he'd like to uh, show people that black rescue dogs are just fine, fine, great dogs. In fact, he I might would even, love that. Okay, we'll make it a date then. <laughs> it's a date already. Mark it in your calendar. <laughs> You know, I've heard anecdotal comments that black cats and dogs are less apt to be adopted Mm -hmm. and the fact that it's called black cat syndrome. Mm -hmm. Do you have any facts or figures uh, um, on uh, how much more difficult it is for a dog or cat that has Mm -hmm. black fur to be adopted? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of groups. They just haven't quite yet come up with sort of like the statistics to back up this sort of experience that we all go through every day. But, you know, we have come across a couple of organizations that have compared white cats with just solid black cats. And because white cats also are a little hard to adopt, you you know, most people are surprised when they hear that. I think it's just a monochromatic coat is what kind of provides the challenge. But from what we have heard, black cats are two-thirds less likely to get adopted than than white cats. So if a white cat is hard to adopt and a black cat is two-thirds less likely than that, it's it really goes to show you how hard they are to get to place in homes. So Wow, that's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And why do you think black cat dog syndrome exists? Oh, you know, it's it's one of these things we all kind of, you know, talk amongst ourselves in the rescue world of like, where does this come from? How can we make it go away? And, um, you know, I think there's a few different things that we've kind of all detected that might be true 
of course, with cats, they kind of have a, that double issue of there's people who are still superstitious and they're afraid of black cats or they just want to stay clear of them for multiple reasons, you know, that I'm not sure how we're going to get over that. But little by little, hopefully we can educate people and they'll realize that black cats are not unlucky. <laughs> Someone like me who has four black cats in their house, I feel pretty lucky every day. So, And then another thing that I think we've all come to realize is when a doctor goes into a shelter, you know, and, and you're looking at all these different amazing animals for adoption, you know, when it comes to cats, you know, you've got orange tabbies and brown tabbies and calicos and all these bright, you know, vivid colors. And then you're scanning across all of these cats and then you have a solid monochromatic black cat. And usually, you know, they kind of visually recede in a shelter environment or, you know, the other colors just pop out. You know, humans are very visually based and pattern based and color based. So I think our natural inclination is to gravitate towards the patterns and the stripes and the brighter colors. So that's one challenge I think they have. But then now that we're moving into a more digital age and rescue groups such as ourselves rely on photographs to get people to notice our cats, you know, when they go on to like Pet Finder or adopt a pet and you're looking at all these different cats and dogs, it's really hard to get a great photo of a black cat or a black dog because the lighting has to be just right. And, you know, you kind of have to, you know, get the right perspective so you can see the outline of their body and, you know, their nose and their ears. And so photographing them is really key, getting a good photographer, as well as just educating people that they aren't bad luck and (laughs) all of that good stuff. So I think that's kind of what the syndrome is about, but I'm hoping little by little we'll be able to chip away at it and make it a thing of the past. You know, something else I've noticed now, I don't know whether it's just... You know, this is anecdotal, but Mm -hmm. uh, when I take Max for a walk, a lot of times uh, we walk with a neighbor who has a yellow lab, almost Mm -hmm. the same size and energy level as Max. And when we go through the park, almost invariably, people will be attracted to the yellow lab before they'll be attracted to Max. They'll go to him, they'll pet him, and if Max comes towards him, they almost, many times, not all the time, but many times, they'll shrink back. So, again, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's in this culture that black cats, even black dogs, are used as uh, signs of evil, so to speak. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so, yeah. I'm, and the photography thing, I know for sure, because uh, yeah. whenever I try to shoot him, you know, it's it works best if he if the lighting is really good. Like if he's outside, yeah. if the yeah. if the light, I can get the contrast because when you look at him, really look at him, black cats and dogs really have a fascinating pattern you know they're not just pure black exactly you're right it takes the uh lighting or a very good camera person to pick that up so um but that all works to their disadvantage doesn't it it really does well it's time for a break for our sponsors but when we get back we're going to learn more about black cat and black dog syndrome and about chicago cat rescue we'll be right back right after these messages stay tuned Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Vacs are powerful bagless upright vacuums for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Vac, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Vac today. Dyson. Music to your ears. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Robin Gansert, President and CEO of American Humane Association, the country's first national humane organization, here to tell you about our new show, Be Humane, on Pet Life Radio. Each week, we'll be bringing you the latest news and issues affecting our animal friends, and we'll also be bringing you interviews with Hollywood's biggest animal advocates, here to share tales about their pets and what they're doing to promote a more humane world. Our own highly experienced staff and friends of the organization will also join us each week to share what they're up to in the animal world. I hope you'll stop by. Until then, let's always remember to be humane. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Max A. Pooch's Awesome Animal Advocates. I'm your host, Keith Sanderson, and our guest, Julie Adams, was sharing some information about black cat and black dog syndrome. And Julie, you know, while we were talking, it's something else I realized, is I don't recall seeing black cats or black dogs in TV ads or TV programs or in a movie unless they're in a threatening or supernatural role. Do you think this reinforces the black cat, black dog syndrome? Oh, yes. I mean, I can't imagine that it wouldn't reinforce the syndrome itself. You know, it's, I think, you know, when people are creating television ads and movies and casting roles for bad cats and bad dogs, you know, it's just, I think society, our culture still envisions sort of like the black cat, you know, as like the perfect cat to place in that role. So I think it's sort of a, you know, they kind of are reinforcing themselves, you know, it's something I think people expect to see, but yet it's being brought out again in the movie. So I it, absolutely, it's definitely reinforcing it, <laughs> making it harder to do our job. <laughs> so I was wondering about that because typically there'll be multicolored cats and dogs used in ads mm-hmm. and, and you never see a black one. And another question, you know, I did a little research, but I didn't research far, but I couldn't find in the short time I was looking anybody else who does anything quite like you guys do to raise awareness. Are you aware of any other groups? Offhand, I know, um, you know, Treehouse Humane Society, they do their black cat ball every year. I'm not sure if it was specifically designed to raise awareness, but I'm sure it's tr- trending that way because you know, I can only imagine how sexy that event would be, <laughs> being a ball, you know. In Chicago, I don't, besides their ball, I'm not quite sure. I have not heard of another group that has specifically created a benefit to raise awareness for these animals. There's a lot of, you know, information online and pages and articles dedicated to the syndrome, but no, I not offhand I haven't come across any just yet. So it would seem to me that for any shelter or um, rescue that is having trouble uh, getting their uh, black cats and dogs adopted, this would be a good thing to do, a little educational or some kind of special program. Yeah. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, we when we talk to people, you know, like other groups and shelters, we encourage them to put every animal has a little bio that they write up to kind of describe their personality and even just including in their bio on their websites at the bottom or, or at the top that black cats and dogs are harder to adopt just because that's like your chance to kind of educate the person that might have looked at their page or, you know, have breezed past the page and maybe just get them to stop for a minute and read it and, and think about it. So just as simple as that could make a huge impact for black cats and dogs and just talking about it to potential adopters as they come into your shelter or they call you on the phone and there's many different ways. So. Let's say you said this was the sixth year you had the event. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the catalyst that got you started on doing it? Well, actually, it was just this underlying, you know, frustration that both Cindy and I had. You know, we've been doing rescue work for quite a long time, as well as, you know, volunteering for other groups and just over and over seeing these amazing black animals just 
sitting for a very long time in shelters and just not getting adopted for months and months and months or even sometimes years. So just that experience alone was what sort of kind of spurred this wanting desperately to educate the community. And then being a rescue group, you know, we also have to, you know, we do fundraising and events to obviously to mingle with our supporters and to raise funds for the cats in our care. So we thought it was just like the perfect blend of having a, an event and to raise awareness and to just celebrate black cats and dogs. So it really brings out some pretty incredible people from the community who have adopted black cats and dogs. And it's really every year we meet new people. It's so much fun. And I feel like little by little, it's making a dent, you know, because then those people who come to the event, they go back out into the world the next day and they, they continue to talk about it. So that's pretty much kind of how it all started was just this sort of like, we got to make it, we got to figure out a way to change this. Now, what goes on at your event? For our listeners who might be thinking of doing something similar, do you have mm-hmm. uh, raffles? Do you have sponsors? Do you? Yep. So why don't you describe, if I were to arrive, what would I see? <laughs> well, if you arrive, first thing you're probably going to see is me. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, so, you know, it's really a great event. It's at night, you know, and we always have really cool lighting and uh, music and food. And, of course, there's a raffle. We get amazing prizes donated from our community every year to help us raise additional funds, as well as, of course, there's a a bar. There's drinks a-flowing. So that's some of the basics that you can expect to experience. But what's cool in addition to that being it's specifically for black cats and dogs is everybody who has adopted a black cat or dog, we encourage them to send us their photos of their black pets ahead of time because what we do for the event is we put all of those photos, we assemble them into a big like slideshow that we present on the wall. It's usually like, you know, 15 feet wide and 10 feet tall. It's really huge and it just keeps circulating through all the amazing black pets that people have um, submitted. So they get to see their black cat or dog, you know, presented basically at this event, sort of at larger than life size. And then we also get each person who has adopted a black cat and dog, they get, we make little buttons for them to wear. So as they walk around and mingle with other people, you know, they have photos of their black pets. They're wearing them on their clothes, sort of a conversation starter. Some people have, you know, like six buttons and some people have one, you know, because it just depends on how many, how many black cats and dogs you have in your family. And then we always do a special raffle prize specifically for somebody who has adopted a black cat or dog. So we collect all those names and we do a special raffle and we pull their name out of the hat. So people who adopt black cats and dogs who come to our event really get celebrated, which is fun. So... Well, that's great. That's great. Speaking of black cats, how many do you have available now for adoption at Chicago Cat Rescue? We have several, actually. And surprisingly, just in the last couple of weeks, which I think writing all of the coattails of all of this awareness campaign that we're doing, several of them have got adopted, which is fantastic. But we've got a few amazing, actually, kittens, if you can believe it, black kittens that are looking for their forever home. So if you go to our website, chicagocatrescue.org, you'll check out, we've got Genevieve, who is a beautiful little long-haired black kitten. And then we have two siblings, Ushi and Uzo, who are absolutely stunning. They have, they're black, but they have this like smoky undercoat to them. So like in the light, they almost kind of have this like iridescent gray. It's hard to describe. You just have to see them. They're just so beautiful. So yeah, we have black cats for adoption. And how about how many cats at any one time do you have available? Yeah, I mean, the numbers fluctuate, of course, uh, depending on the season. You know, kitten season is coming. So, But right now, we have sev- about 70 cats and kittens in our program. And, you know, we kind of keep it around that, but it does kind of go up and down depending on the season. So, Wow, 70. And, uh, yeah. boy, that's a lot of work, finding foster <laughs> homes for all it those is. guys and yeah. getting vetted and everything. Hey, Julie, I ask each of my guests this question. Mm-hmm. And how, with all the human misery and suffering in the world, can you justify spending time, money, and resources advocating for animals? You know, that's definitely a good question. There are so many worthy causes out there, you know, that are their mission is to end suffering and misery. And every single one of them deserve time, money, resources. In my opinion, it's just a matter of identifying the skill and the expertise of the people involved and applying it 
applying your skill to where you can make the most impact. And in my case, and you know, in Cindy's case, our skill set is definitely when it, where it comes to the animals, and we we know a lot about cats, and that's where we can make the biggest impact to end you know some of the the suffering out there for animals. So it's a great question. When you were growing up, did you have pets? Did I have pets? Woo! Let me see. How much time do we have? (laughs) (laughs) I had, my parents were also animal rescuers, um, and we lived in the country, so that just allows you to have many, 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 many more animals. You know, I had lots and lots of cats growing up because people would abandon them in the country, and then they would find their way to my parents' house, and we would keep them, you know. So we had upwards of 15 to 20 cats at a time, several dogs. I had rats. Rabbits, hamsters, fish. I would take care of the the frogs that lived in the wells around my house. We had lots and lots of, we wanted to get horses, but we didn't quite make it that far. We all kind of grew up too fast, I guess. But yeah, I I have been surrounded with pets my whole life. Well, I think that's, you know, true of of a lot of advocates. You become aware at an early time of the uh, special bond that there is between humans and pets, and uh, then you just continue. Hey, where can I find more information about Chicago Cat Rescue? You can go to our website. We have a website, chicagocatrescue.org, where it talks a little bit more about us and our uh, sexy black event. Or, you know, check us out on our Facebook page as well. So we kind of, we're always posting our cats for adoption, cats that need foster homes, upcoming events. So those are the two places to check us out. Okay. And what about uh, information about black cat, black dog syndrome? Can I just Google that or do you have any sites? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of different sites. Yeah. I mean, you could probably go to any of the main humane organizations, you know, like ASPCA and, you know, the Humane Society. You know, we have some information on on our page as well. Under the events page, we kind of describe uh, the black cat and dog syndrome. So if you Google it, you will get a plethora of information. You know what? It's hard to believe, but we're already out of time. Thank you so much for being with us today, Julie. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for the opportunity to to spread the word for black cats and dogs. I really appreciate it. Well, be sure to remind us, and uh, Max A. Pooch would love to be part of your event next year. And keep up the work, because Max A. Pooch gives you and all those who volunteer at Chicago Cat Rescue five big tail-wagging wolves. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you. I'll take those. (laughs) Okay, good. You deserve them. We want to thank you, our listeners, for spending your valuable time with us. You're all fantastic, and we hope you tell your friends about Awesome Animal Advocates. And a special thanks to Mark Winter, co-founder and executive producer of Pet Life Radio, and our sponsors for making this episode of Max A. Pooch's Awesome Animal Advocates possible. I'm Keith Sanderson, host and creator of Max A. Pooch's Awesome Animal Advocates, saying thank you to all those animal advocates who work so hard on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. Max A. Pooch gives them five big tail-wagging woofs. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.